Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to New Life, whether you're here in person or online. I'm Jimmy, the pastor here. And first of all, we got to thank the Lord that we didn't get this kind of snow they were predicting, right? I'm really glad we didn't get eight inches of snow. I'm not a fan of snow. But we're glad you're here, and we're just going to get into it today, get into the Word, and God's got a great message for us all. You know what? Life isn't fair. Or somebody got something that I wanted, and or I deserved. You know, it's just not fair, right? You ever said that? You ever said life's not fair? Come on, be real. Yeah. I have. I know you probably have as well. Life isn't fair, we say sometimes. Or, you know, I should have gotten this. They got it. I, and it's just, it's not fair. You know, my job isn't fair. Marriage isn't fair. So, all this stuff isn't fair. You know, God's not fair. Have you ever said that one? Unfortunately. Yeah, more than we like to admit, we probably all have said it. Or a lot of us have said it. But, you know, guess what? That's true. God's not fair. And today, we're going to be talking about why that is actually a good thing. So stick with me. We're going to get there. But welcome to the first service of New Life here in 2022. And we're continuing the parables of Jesus today. And today we're going to be in the parable of the vineyard workers. It's in Matthew 20, verses 1 through 16. So before we get into that word and that parable, I'm going to do a little bit of, well, Oh, come on, it's me. So we got to ask a question. What job did you have where you had like your favorite boss? Nurse's aide. What was that? Nurse's aide. Nurse's aide. I'm going to be looking online as well. Anybody else had a the really... Army. The army. The army. Ooh, man, I could not imagine like a, a sergeant or somebody yelling and screaming at me. I don't, I don't know how you, you could do that, but praise the Lord. You fought for us, and we thank you for that. And I'll be watching on online too and stuff. But for me, my the job that I had, that I had my favorite boss. I worked with my dad in Chicago Public Schools. We were installing windows and doing that kind of stuff. And I really the the reason why my dad was like the best boss to me is because he was honest, he was fair, he was hardworking, and he did his job with excellence. And, you know, where carpentry is not my passion, I did okay with it, and I helped out, I enjoyed the work, but what I witnessed, the characteristics in him, you know, the hardworking fairness, the honesty, the integrity, those were the things that I want to carry with me through life and everything that I do. And, you know, I, I think, you know, he was like the best boss I could have. But, you know, he was fair. And I want to be fair. But today we're going to talk about why God isn't fair and why that's a good thing. So in context, we're going to take you back a little bit. We'll be in Matthew 19 for a little bit. And if you have your Bible, I invite you to follow along. I'm just kind of going to highlight him some stuff. You can follow along and be like, okay, yep, check, you got that, check. You got that. And, you know, and I'll read a few verses as well. But in context, in Matthew 19, Jesus was with his disciples, and a man came who was described as a rich young ruler. He came and he asked Jesus, What shall I do to have eternal life? And Jesus said, Keep my commandments. And Long story short, the rich young ruler said, okay, I've done that stuff. What do I still lack? Which I find is interesting. He knew that he was still not a recipient of eternal life. He knew that he had not obtained it yet. And in Matthew 19, verse 21, Jesus answered and said, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven. Then come follow me. Which... He said, if you want to be perfect, but he still didn't say that doing these things are going to give this guy eternal life. And the rich young ruler, he was so concerned about his money, he didn't want to give up everything he had, didn't want to give up his life, his lifestyle, so he went away sad. Which, 
I made a little note to myself that that's going to be a great sermon for the for the future. Sometime talk about that and study that a little bit more. But Jesus said after the man left, well, the disciples said, well, who can be saved? If, if you know, that's the case, who can be saved? And Jesus said, with man, this is impossible, meaning being saved. But with God, all is possible. So to sum up, nobody could earn their eternal life. Nobody could earn salvation. It's solely based on the grace of God. And Peter said, right after that, well, we left everything. We followed you. What are we going to have? And Jesus said in verses 28 and 29, Assuredly I say to you that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits at the throne of glory, you will have followed me, and also will sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel, and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name, sake, shall receive a hundredfold and inherent eternal life. So Peter was worried. I, obviously, after seeing something like that, he was kind of like, whoa, whoa, wait, wait, what about us? We, we did leave things. We left stuff behind. But you're saying that, you know, it's not with man. We can't do this. And I'd be kind of worried too. And so he asked, and Jesus said, don't worry, basically. Don't worry. I'm not going to forget about what you've done. And then he makes an interesting statement in verse 30. He said, but many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. And I always kind of stopped reading after that, like, okay, let's tie up in a nice little bow, we're good, that's the end of the story. But it actually ties in then. He tells a parable in Matthew 20 to illustrate his point. And, you know, that's what we're, we've been talking about about parables. It's taking something that's common, something that's well known as setting it alongside something spiritual so that those spiritual truths will be easier to understand. So we're reading, our main passage here is Matthew 20, verses 1 through 16. And I invite you to follow along. If you have your Bible at home, I'm reading from the New New, what am I, New International Version, right? Thank you. My computer person here helped me out with that one. So Matthew 20, verses 1 through 16. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He said to them, You also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again around noon and about three in the morning or three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, Why have you been standing here all day doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, You also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the workers and pay them their wages beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive... <clears throat> sorry. They expected to re receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. And when they received it, many began to grumble against the land order. Those who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and have made, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the work and heat of the day. But he answered unto them, Am I not being unfair to you, my friend? Or, yeah, am I not being unfair to you, my friend? Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want to do with my own money? Or are you envious because I'm generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. So, like I said, this is something that the audience would probably 
understand and relate to and probably would be outrageous to them. You know, they they all had worked. They they had knew what it was like to receive pay for your work. And I think this is probably one of the most controversial of Jesus' parables. And even today, just like back then, when you read it, you think, man, that's not fair. You know, back then, workday was considered from sun up to sundown. So about 12 hours of the day. So about 6 o'clock in the morning to 6 o'clock at night is when people would work. And the average pay for a workday was one denarius. And so if we think about in 2022 here, what that would be like, you know, we look at this, this year, beginning of 2022, minimum wage has been raised to $12 an hour. So $144 per day. So imagine working 12 hours in the heat of the day, your arms are tired, your back is sore. You might even have a little bit of sunburn because you've been out in that heat of the day. And you find out that the ones that showed up an hour before quitting time received $144 just like you did. You know, you start thinking, that's not fair. And, you know, before you actually got what you received, when you're watching them get that money, and, you know, so Mark gets $144, which means that if I work 12 hours, I should get like 12 times as much as that, which I'm not good at math, so I'm not going to do the math on that. But you might, you're thinking, if they got that much, how much more am I going to get? It's going to be good because I've earned it. I was here. I did this. I've done this. Me, 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 basically. And then they hand you $144. Wait, what? That's no fair. I'm going to call the Better Business Bureau. I'm going to put on Facebook and on all the social medias how, you know, this boss is not fair. If fairness is treating everyone equally, then it's true that the landowner is unfair. But remember the beginning of this parable. Jesus started by saying the kingdom of God is like. So wait a minute, Jimmy. You're saying that the kingdom of God is unfair. Yes, I am. Praise the Lord that the kingdom of God is unfair. Because just like the owner gave generously, God does not give us what we deserve. Because if we really got what we deserved, we deserve eternal damnation. We've lived a lifetime of disobedience. We've sinned through the years. We've chosen flesh over God. And if we have that sin, we deserve eternal damnation. Nothing we can do on our own strength, on our own, no amount of good deeds that we do can balance the scales to where we have enough good to outweigh the bad without Jesus. We can never earn our way to heaven and to salvation. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, It is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. No one can say, I've earned it. I've done enough. I've been good enough. I've got what it takes. Grace is something that can't be earned. Grace is God giving you what you don't deserve, which means God was not being fair. Because what we deserve is not good. And God gave us something so much better with his grace that we can't earn. Because everyone who makes Jesus Lord receives an equal inheritance in the kingdom of God. Now notice that Jesus bookended this parable in, in chapter 1930. He said, but many who are first will be last and many who are last will be first. And then in chapter 20, verse 16, he said, and the last will be first and the first will be last. 
kingdom of God is not like anything we expect, not like anything our human minds can really even comprehend. We're lucky to get a glimpse of this from God, to him showing us a little bit about what the kingdom of heaven is like and how God's kingdom is completely different than the, what the world considers fair, good, and right. And that, again, is a good thing. Praise the Lord that it's different than what the world expects. What the world considers important, the status, the seniority, education, wealth, all those other things, all kinds of stuff. That doesn't matter to God. His generosity is a great equalizer in the kingdom. So there's two messages that speak to us today from this parable. Two messages for us followers of Jesus today. First of all, first, first thing that Jesus wants us to remember, don't think too highly of yourself. Yep. You might have been a Christian your whole life. You might have been so good, you know, maybe in a uh, an altar boy or whatever those, you know, things are, or in a choir and, and, you know, followed and done all this stuff, led Bible studies, taught Sunday school, all kinds of wonderful things, never strayed from, too far from your faith. That's awesome. That's wonderful. I applaud you. The angels are applauding. They're happy. God is happy that you've done so well. And there'll be a time when they'll say, well done, my good and faithful, faithful servant but you have not earned a higher place of honor because of however many years of service. None of us have, can earn a higher place in the kingdom because of service. None of us are better or deserve to look down on any, anyone because of our years and our experience or our resume. God doesn't love you more than others because of what you've done. He doesn't, you know, I mean... I appreciate people that don't give me a hard time. I'm sure God appreciates that you didn't give him a hard time for all these years, but you're not in a position higher than anyone else. We have to remember to be humble. We have to remember we haven't earned the right to lord it over others that have struggled, that have gone through some difficult times. We haven't earned the right to be God's cops or truant officers in the church. Parable in this parable, we learn that God operates on love and grace, not by human standards. The human standard is to be to receive retribution for the work you've done, your performance-based retribution. But when we humbly recognize, just like Romans 3.23 says that all have sinned, every one of us has sinned, and fall short of the glory of God, we begin to think about, remem remember, understand, and have a humble heart, remembering that without the forgiveness of God, all of us deserve hell. If we received what we deserved, it would be death, separation, eternal damnation. But all of us have been made equal in the Lord because of the cross, because of Jesus, because we didn't get what we deserved. The second message, I want that this is where I want to focus on even more. This is a message of hope. I don't ever want us to leave discouraged thinking, oh well, Jimmy said I need to sit down and shut up because I don't have I'm not important. Don't hear that. Because that's not what I said. You are all important. And this is where the message of hope. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 is still probably on the screen right now. That's wonderful news. That it's by by grace, we're saved through faith, not of works. Nothing we do, which means I don't have to worry that somebody has done something better, somebody's done something longer, somebody's more talented, somebody's doing better stuff. You know, when I was at my first co pastor's conference, like I think it was eight, nine years ago, down in Decatur, Illinois, we were sitting there and they take some time where they recognize what's called the forerunners, the People that have been pastors for 25 years, you know, and and more, but they recognize when they're in their 25th year, and some then when they're in their 50th year, and 
we were, they were recognizing people, they were calling up all these old folks, and I leaned over to my friend Julie, who, who was a pastor as well, and I said, just think about how close I would have been to being a forerunner if I hadn't messed up, screwed up for so many years of my life. And she reminded me, you're here now. What God doesn't hold your past against you. All that matters is what you do now that you're following him. These, those forerunners, they're wonderful and they're a great example. We stand on the shoulders of those who came before us, but they're equals. They're, they're equals in the kingdom. It doesn't matter if we've been in church for one day or a hundred years, or if we've been messing up every day of the week. When we come to him, he makes us equals. When we come to him and make him our Lord, we're cleansed of all the sins that we've had in the past. We're cleansed of all the garbage, all the things that basically we thought probably would have eliminated us from being useful in the kingdom. That's gone. We can all be used by the kingdom because we've been made new. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. All things have been made new in him. So now we get to further the kingdom. You can be used. You, you, you can be used to further the kingdom of God. By grace, we receive full inheritance in the kingdom. And we receive unique gifts, abilities, and assignment. We don't have to be like what we even are told is a ministry position. We don't have to be the upfront people. You know, just for example, I couldn't get this these Sundays done in person without our people in the in the tech booth. They don't do it for recognition. They don't do it to be seen. They're behind the scenes. There's other things that happen behind the scenes that are just as important. We're the body of Christ. We have many parts. If he's calling you to an upfront position, that's great. I'd love a Sunday off or a Sunday off from singing or something, but that's not the only thing. I don't have any special favor in the eyes of God because I get up here and preach every Sunday. I'm just doing what God has equipped me to do and called me to do. Your gifting might not be that, and that's okay. Well, but but I'm not that. I'm not. I'm not good enough, or I'm not. I haven't been trained. I. Don't, you know what? That's fine. You are not, but God equips you for whatever service He's choosing to use you. God equips you, and in Jesus, you are unstoppable. You can have impact on your church, on your family, on your sphere of influence, and on your community to make Jesus known. None of us is any less important than anyone else. So stop comparing. Stop looking at somebody else and thinking, well, they, they do it better. Or they, you know what? They're doing what God has called them to do. You do what he's called you to do. You can be a prayer. You can be a prayer warrior. You can be an encourager. You can vacuum the floor. It's all part of contributing to the kingdom, and it's all just as important. Whatever we do is not what saves us and does not make us earn God's grace. You don't have to wait to be mature or to know more. You start right here, right now, and the Jesus in you will impact this world. You know, and just so you, just to get, throw this out there because, you know, Jesus started with the last, or the first will be last and last will be first and then ended with the last will be first and the first will be last. That's not Jesus saying to wait until the final hour, to wait until you're ready to begin following him because none of us knows when the end is going to happen. None of us knows, and we do not want to be found without him. Because if we're found without Jesus when he returns, it's too late. We're done. We're eternally separated from Jesus. So the question is, are, are you ready? Are you ready 
to follow him, to serve him. Whether you've been in church for a hundred years or a year or whatever it is, or you're watching online, first service you ever tuned into, are you ready to follow Jesus and to receive not what you deserve, but the grace of God because he loves you, because he wants you to be with him through all eternity. What a better way to what better way to start 2022, knowing that we're right with God, that our future is secure in Him. No matter how long it's taken you, how many times you've messed up, how far over the line you've strayed, what sins you have in your life, you're never so far gone that you're out of reach of the forgiveness in Jesus Christ. It's not too late. Don't let it be too late. All you have to do is confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Confess, meaning that you're speaking from your heart, speaking from your full understanding, your full belief is that Jesus is your Lord. Jesus is the Lord. And that God raised him from the dead and you'll be saved. You can pray. I'll show you a quick prayer that those of us that do know him, easy to share with others as well. God, I recognize that without you, there's no way for me to be good enough, no way for me to receive salvation. It's only in making you Lord. So today I give my heart, my life, my everything to you, to make you my Lord. And today I will begin living as a resident of the kingdom of heaven. In Jesus' name, amen.